Welcome to Golden Mastermind Seminars Radio with your host, Jeffrey Combs. Good afternoon, Jeffrey Combs, President and Founder of Golden Mastermind Seminars Incorporated on a 2-4 Tuesday. It is Tuesday, December 14th. Welcome to Facebook Live. Great to connect with you. Go ahead and let me know you're here on Facebook Live as I see my wife is sending me photographs from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. My wife today is on her holiday vacation in Rio de Janeiro. So good to see everyone today. Scott Lucas, look forward to coaching you later this evening. Brittany Simon, welcome to Facebook Live. Aaron Knight, awesome coaching you this morning. Jason Anders, welcome to Facebook Live this afternoon. Josh Morton, Josh Moran, Josh, I loved your I loved your video today. I saw you benching. How much was that, Josh? Kimberly Shimbari, welcome. Ron Ziegler, longtime follower. Brittany Simon, good to see you this afternoon. Jesse Morin Thompson and Ron Ziegler. Scott, how are you? So this is part two of a three-part series on codependence that I'm covering. So I started last night on codependence. J.A. Johns, good to see you. Earl Teets, longtime follower, and, and, and good to see you, Earl. David Keefe, good to see you. Wendy Thompson, good to see you. So this is part two of a three-part series on codependence. Last night I focused on codependent relationships, intimate relationships. Today I'm going to focus on codependency in the business world and who you attract and how to be able to create the separation or how to create, how to separate your feelings from the events and how to be able to detach. John Lundberg, good to see you. John said, I am the man. John, thank you very much. Josh, hitting back squat, see, hitting back squats for the first time in eight years. 315 pounds, five reps, loving the process. So for those of you who are following, that is my exceptional client who is an exceptional young man who I had the privilege of coaching many times over the last seven years. That's Josh Moran, and he, if you get an opportunity, Josh Moran, he's also a success coach that I highly endorse. He was squatting 315 pounds today. He did five reps after multiple back surgeries and is in recovery of the pain body. So Gina Martin, is it Martini? Gina Martini, welcome, and we're going to move into the inspirational portion of today's call. As I do on many Facebook Lives, I refer books to you, books from my specific library that I have. I have thousands of books. Well, let me rephrase that. I have a couple thousand books in my library. Now, I have them in two different rooms in my house. This is a book that I highly recommend. This is one of the most unique books I have ever owned. And I I apologize if it looks backwards. I forgot to hit the little flipper. But that book is called Why You Behave in Ways You Hate. It has chapters on it has a chapter on parents in there that really absolutely breaks down what that household structure was like and the effect that it had on you. So that book I highly recommend. The author's name is Gutnik, and the name of the book one more time is Why You Behave in Ways You Hate. Also, you can find content from the book today that I'm covering in Codependent No More and Beyond Codependency. For those of you who are brand new to my Facebook Lives, I do Facebook Lives every evening at 9 p.m. Pacific, that is Monday through Thursday, 6 o'clock on Friday and Saturday, and and Sunday, 7 o'clock. And then every Tuesday, I do a two for Tuesday, 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific and 9 o'clock Pacific. Now, last night, I did a Facebook Live. Matt Smith, one of my clients, asked me if I would cover codependency and relationship, recovery of codependent relationships. So what that means is you start to have you start to have boundaries, and you start to detach from relationships that are unhealthy. You can virtually become addicted to a person or the energy of a person and similar energies that you'll keep attracting over and over to perpetuate the same set of feelings that keep you emotionally addicted. Now, the most common addictions that you will become addicted to, or the most common emotions that you will become addicted to is rejection, abandonment, and resentment. Those three tend to work together. Now, they're all distinctly different, so I'll explain these for you. Rejection is when someone is highly critical of you, and it can be a physical rejection, it can be an emotional rejection, but it can also be, I mean, it just depends. It can be sexual abuse, it can be gaslighting, ghosting, multiple traumas, 
Uh, it can be verbal. It can be highly critical. It can be a parent. It can be a brother, a sister. It can be someone in your neighborhood, but you feel traumatized. You feel picked on and taunted. And if you get teased, then that can be a whole way of life. So if you're going to school every morning in fight or flight, anxiety about the outcome that hasn't happened, you are becoming emotionally addicted to a set of feelings, and that would be rejection. Now, if you lived in a household or you had a good household that appeared to be a good household, and your parents were very busy, or your, your family was very busy, or you were one of the last child, you were the first child, whatever the situation is, there's fulfillment in the household, meaning that there are, there are things, and it looks like you are, you look like you're in a good household, but there's no emotional love. So you may have, you may have been traded money for love, or you may have gotten trinkets and toys for love, or you may have been sent off to boarding school or vacation, but there was no love in that relationship, and so you were abandoned. So there's the, the parents provided, but they didn't provide love, so that is abandonment. That will set you up to attract your reality, people in situations of unfulfillment. So this is, so this is how you start to separate abandonment and rejection. Now, I typically run them together when I'm breaking down the emotions. And then resentment is what you will tend to receive frequently, and it's the abiding anger. So there's anger, there's hate, and then there's resentment. And resentment is an anger that you stuff. And this is the anger that comes from codependence when you're over-obligating, enabling, doing more for others than you do for yourself. Now, this will show up in business in a team. You lead the team, you host the team, you do things for the team, you do events with the team, you have parties, you go on trips, whatever it is you do, and then but your team isn't producing. And so then you then internalize that by, I'm doing everything for them. I've done everything for you. And this also happens when you, then the communication is, they left me. They cheated on me. Well, instead of, this is in recovery, you learn to separate the me part. So if someone in, that you're in a relationship with had an affair, that's how you, it's, they had an affair. It wasn't on you. They weren't, they weren't standing on you. It wasn't on me. They had an affair. That's how you begin to separate the feelings from the facts so that you're not the mind-body connection to those feelings so you don't recreate, regenerate, and continue to create the same situation to fulfill the same set of feelings. For those of you who are not on last night's Facebook Live, I covered codependence and the origins. Codependence typically comes from a loss of identity. It comes from a loss of innocence. Now, it's, it's not uncommon if you grow up in an alcoholic household that whether you're a man or a woman, oftentimes if you're a talented child, a brilliant child, you become the therapist to a father or a mother, you become the provider, you may be, you have to go out and earn money and you have to give your money to your family, you take care of your family, you support your family. I mean, now, now this is setting you up neurologically to take care of a lot of people. And I mean, this, this becomes a conditioned response. It becomes an autonomic response that this is who I am and what I do. So this means you, you, there's a high probability you'll become a rescuer, you'll become an over-obligator and an enabler. You'll attract a reality, like-minded people to fulfill the same set of feelings. So if you're an adult child of an alcoholic, the A-C-O-A, -A, adult child of alcoholics, adult child of an addict, did you grow up with a mother who was chronically in bed, who had chronic pain, who had chronic headaches, any multitude of situations, and then you become the caretaker, you become the doctor, the therapist, any multitude of situations. I have actually also, I've actually coached women before, and I've said to them, I've asked them, did your mother hit on your boyfriends? And she goes, oh my God, how did you know? Well, I could feel it. I have a, I've coached 60,000 hours one-on-one. -on -one. I have a lot of repetition and experience. So I understand how that happens. And so did you ever have a parent who was who was treated you like they were your friend, not your parent? And then there's the good parent and the bad parent. So if you had this situation, this is setting you up to be codependent, a loss of innocence, over-obligation. And then if guilt is used to control you, then that can also be a very prevalent situation as you go out into being a teenager, adulthood, and then this is these are the type of people you'll attract. You'll attract your reality, people in situations to fulfill your feelings. Now, in the business world, in the so if you own a business or if you're building a team 
or if you're part of a communal team that you're building a culture in a team and this team and this is your team and there's this team, there's these teams of teams and the skill requires attraction skills, well, there's going to be this 80%. I mean, there's the 80% is the web. That's the web of everyone out there. So there's always going to be this 80%. But in breaking down the law of the few, there's the 20%, the 10%, the 5%, the 1%. And then the extreme law of the few, the one twentieth. That's one slash two zero of one. The law of the few, one twentieth of one. So and then, if you're looking, if you're in a team and you're you're going to get compensated in this team and have leverage that compensates you, well, then that's also it's going to be your responsibility to really understand that attraction is a skill. And so, if codependency is a major component of your personality, it's a major component of your in of your of your energy, then you're going to attract people who will disappoint you. And you will make up stories about people to disappoint yourself. And then you'll say things like, they ghosted me, they, they rejected me. When in reality, people typically don't ghost you, they just check out. They're not interested. And when you get attached, now here's a key component in, in understanding codependency. Codependency creates attachment. We get, we, myself included, I'm a recovery codependent, we get attached to people and situations. We make stories and make dumb shit up about people and situations, and then we find ways to make them wrong. We get into conflict with them. They tell, we tell ourselves stories. We have challenges letting go of them because the ego, the analytically egoic mind, wants to feel rejected. So if you're addicted to rejection, you're going to attract people and situations to fulfill those feelings. And then if you can't find someone to reject you, you'll reject yourself by being critical. So when you're your own worst enemy, I mean, that's, and people say this before, I'm my own worst enemy. What that really means is you're highly critical of yourself. So this often comes from, I've coached hundreds of these people, people who cut themselves. Now, I, I, I was not a cutter, but I did cut myself once down the grain. It was a weak attempt at suicide. I didn't think I could ever kick alcohol. And so I cut myself and did what an addict is. I butterflied the stitches up and went out and got hammered. I mean, that's what an addict does. Addicts like drama, chaos, and an addict always wants a little more. Also, if you're codependent, there's a lot of apathy. That's another emotion that, that comes into codependency. That's a fourth emotion. So there's abandonment, rejection, resentment, apathy. Now, codependents tend to be very sensitive and very defensive. They tend to be very apathetic, meaning they go into, they go into deep fits of, of despondency, oftentimes depression, suicidal thoughts. That doesn't mean they're going to commit suicide, but there's the romance with it because they're not good enough. And so this is a low level of energy. It typically leads to a lot a, a lot of codependent personality stuff their feelings with food. That's the number one addiction of a codependent. That's the second addiction. That, and then there's also alcohol and pharmaceutical medication, over-the-counter medication. They tend to they tend to come together. So th this can all be rectified by being by moving into a higher level of sobriety. Now here's here's another situation that that happens. So codependents hate to be alone. This is one of their stories. I'm not sure what it like to be alone. I'm not sure if I can be alone. I'm not sure I'm worried about being alone. And in reality, you're going to be much better off being alone than you are with people who abandon and reject you. But this this isn't how the ego, the ego, the ego requires someone to feel a feeling. So when you're saying, I'm not sure if I can be alone, what you're saying is I'm not sure if I can stop drinking. I mean, I said the same thing. I wasn't sure if I could stop drinking because alcohol became my mistress. I had a story in my head that vodka was glamorous. It really wasn't because what vodka became was a place that I would lay, but the end of my drinking career, I was laying on the bathroom floor every single day, seven days a week with a blanket because I graduated into, into alcohol poisoning. I drank so, I consumed so much alcohol daily that I became poisoned by it. And then I eventually graduated into what are called delirium tremens. That's not tremors. They're tremens, and it means the body that shakes and the body that convulses. And this, uh, this happened to me at 31 years old. That, the, what that meant, that's how much rage that I lived in and how much anger and how much hate I lived in. So the, now when, this is typically when you can, when you will let go, when the pain is great enough. Now, I don't suggest that that's how you do this. I suggest that you let go today. And that you, you bring your personalities into one. Now, for those of you who I've coached in the last few years, 
especially this last year, I've watched many of you really come into your power and like really step it up and like step it up in emotionally and really step it up into consciousness, especially those of you who really understand what's going on behind the veil of what's going on in 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 the world today. I'm very proud of those of you, and that's, that's most of you on this Facebook Live, is you're like starting to see beyond that which is physical. Because your inner knowing, you know, like your consciousness, knows that you're being lied to. You know that there's a veil that's been lifted over your head. You know that the vaccines and the mask and the pandemic and the election, you know more than most of the world and society. You're not watching mainstream media. You're finding other news sources. And then you're connecting with people of like mind. You're coming together with these people. But this is, this is what I, I have this conversation with so many of you every single day. This brilliance, that's what you have. I have it too. And the difference between me and you is I've been at it a lot longer. I was right where you were. I was at rock bottom. I was um, I was emotionally bankrupt. I was near physical bankruptcy. I was $100,000 in credit card debt once. I mean, I knew I had it, but I didn't know I had it. So that was the fucked up contradiction I would live in. It's like I, I knew it, but I didn't. So that was like I, I I could go up, but I knew I could go down. So and I would live in this 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 constant yo-yo. And that's what created headaches for me. That was the pain body. It means I was in a chronic state of pain. I also did not know how codependent I was, how needy I was, how addicted to recognition I was. That's also a form of codependency. Codependence require recognition. Oh, thank you, Jeff. You're the fucking man. Thank you for everything you do for me. Well, that that's an ego that depends on recognition. Now the the ego that is the, as you let go of your ego and you let go of that ego, the ego that that is in the egoic mind, the analytical egoic mind, as you let go of that, then you step into a place called consciousness. In consci- consciousness is now self-esteem requires no recognition. That means that you can produce in a very relaxed body for minutes, hours, days at a time with no recognition because you've moved across this place. There's there's no fanfare for the common man. It means you've crossed the bridge. It means you're so comfortable with yourself that you are yourself. And in that state of that state of consciousness, you can see what's going on in the outer world and not get angry about it. You cannot get overwhelmed by it. And when you relapse, they're in smaller increments than they used to be. They can be, I mean, I mean, they could be a few minutes, an hour, maybe a day, but you won't waste your time because you just understand that your time is too valuable. You won't waste your time being an addict because the pleasure isn't worth the pain as you cross over that bridge. Instead of living in flashes of brilliance, you live in a very relaxed body where you're able to access consciousness and brilliance all at the same time. Now, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm asking you to consider today. So those of you who are on today's Facebook Live that know you have this brilliance within you, you have it. So you you cross the bridge. John Law, good to see you this afternoon. Tracy, awesome to see you. Janet, thank you for being here today. I want to thank all of you who have had the absolute privilege to be your coach today. And I, I, I identify with so much of you because I'm, I'm there with you. I'm just a little more advanced in it. I've put a lot more repetition and experience and devoted the time and the effort. I have 33 years of sobriety at the end of this week. I mean, fuck, nobody does that. I mean, you can, but you don't have to wait 33 years. You can have this today. So here, here's here's the contradiction. You have all this brilliance right here, but yet right over here, you're not sure of yourself. What you require doing is just bring it over here. Just go like this, so you're one with. Now, those of you who are attracting all this content and you're you're attracting all this content, and you're in the know and you're you're sending me videos and you're sending me content. I love that. Keep them coming. But I want you to know that you can do what I'm doing. You can you can create six figures in a calendar month and it's not that difficult. I'm from a very small town, 7,500 people. No one ever mentored me. I never had a, my father was my high school basketball coach. He was a great basketball coach, but no one ever mentored me. I started modeling myself after successful people when I was a teenager. It took me until 31 to get clean and sober. And at 31, I started crossing the bridge. I started going to Unity Church. I went to 12-step meetings. But most importantly, I started reading books voraciously. And not only did I read the books, but I put them into application. I read Louise Hay, which was, if I wouldn't have started reading Louise Hay in my first year of sobriety, I wouldn't be here who I am. Because Louise Hay is where I learned the mind-body connection. I learned, that's where I learned mind-body connections. And it was through Louise Hay I was able to let go of my headaches. Now, it took few years, but I just kept reading the content. I didn't really understand it. I read John Bradshaw early in my career, Healing Your Inner Child. I went to 12-step meetings every single day. 
for a, almost 10 years, but I read voraciously books. I read the self-help books. I read a lot of the business books. But I, when, I started to, when I started to really start to access understanding the mind-body connection and letting go is when my life really started to change. And so I, I was where all of you were once. I had, I had all this brilliance, but I didn't know what the fuck to do with it. I couldn't, I couldn't like turn the handle on it. I could get halfway there, but I couldn't like, I was too, I was afraid I couldn't control the outcome. So I would, I would take the handle and I'd stop and go, whoa, I don't know if I can go there. And I, I would I would get up to this place in money. I'd get this place in money that I couldn't seem to outgrow this one place. And I graduated from like ten thousand a month to fifteen thousand a month to twenty thousand a month. And I could never seem to get above that. And then something would happen, and the bottom would fall out, and I'd be starting over, which was very consistent with the way I lived a lot of my life, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it would be the heroic comeback that I would play. And then I'd go out and find someone and I would start this little team and then I'd do everything for them and I'd control it all up to, to about 5,000 a month and 10,000 a month and the bottom would fall out because I was in control of being out of control. So this is, this is where I started to understand what letting go and being codependent means. It means instead of being codependent, I learned how to be more independent. And being independent means that I could rely on self and I didn't require any recognition from anyone else. And so when you when you can move into that state, this is when you can sep- this is when you can start to be you can have a relationship with yourself rather than trying to get a relationship from someone else. When you when you let go of recognition and reward and shiny objects and sexual situations and and trinkets and toys, when you can let go of that, then you start to find yourself. Because in your true self, you are self. That means that you are good enough. And so when you have self-esteem, you have self-awareness, you have self-actualization, you're self-directed, you're self-employed. So that means you rely on yourself. That means when you have that, when you hear that, but you do this without feeling selfish or feeling guilty. So in letting go of codependency, you're going to have to, you have to understand, you're going to have to let other people hit rock bottom without you trying to control their outcome. And I have this conversation with people seven days a week, but they're my family. I go, that, that's correct. They're your family, but if you want to be in sobriety, you will have to understand that you're not responsible for their addiction. And it's going to be your responsibility to let go of whether it's your family, your friends, or wh- whoever it is. You're not responsible for their addictions. And when you let go of their, if you let feeling, let go of feeling of, of responsible for other people, Mikhail, good to see you. One of my most, my longest term client, Mikhail Jessen. I love you, Mikhail. When you start to let go of feeling responsible for other people, you're moving higher and higher into recovery. So as you build a team, if you have a sales force of people, you have to understand in the law of averages, most people aren't going to do what's going to be required and they're going to quit. They didn't quit on you. They quit on themselves. And as you're able to separate those feelings from that, then you're not responsible. Now, understand the word responsible means ability to respond. It means like this. There's, there's a repetition and an experience to responsibility. Now, this here's what happens. And so, if you're afraid to make a mistake, that this is very this is what many people are. They're afraid to make a mistake. It means that that doubt will keep you from being in faith. Now, I want to see what John says. We don't have to enable their dysfunction. Thank you, John. John Law is a good man. He wrote a good post here. We don't have to enable their dysfunction. Aaron says family often felt adversarial. Cassie says, I am free and I am me, not my monkeys, not my circus. Ooh, good one. That's Cassie Turcott. Thank you very much. Josh says, detach from people and their actions and addictions. Feel free on my Facebook Lives to, to, to share your feelings, all of you, because you're all most all of you are my clients, so we know each other. Feel free to share your feelings and then read each other's content and then create friendships with each other because you're all in this together. This is like a 12-step meeting. Only this is the thirteen. This is the fourteenth step. The fourteenth step is like the next step. It's the quantum leap. So in, in in understanding codependency, step number one is that you understand. It means you accept that you have codependent tendencies. I mean that's it's not that difficult. You accept it without fighting it. You accept it without wrestling with it. You accept it because you love yourself enough that you're ready to let go. The pain is great enough. You've suffered enough. In understanding your codependent tendencies. You start to let go. And then secondly, you start to forgive yourself and the people who've traumatized you, the people who've abandoned you, the people who neglected you, the people who rejected you. So that's number two. And then you also learn to have a longer breath cycle. So you breathe deep into your abdomen. 
and you practice this daily and you start to, you start to forgive yourself, love yourself, practice gratitude for being this level of recovery you're in, stop worrying about what it's going to be like to be by yourself, stop letting and let go of of the guilt you have about taking care of people and rescuing people and you start to focus more on healing yourself without feeling guilty or selfish. Now tonight on Facebook, I'm going to I will host another Facebook live this evening at 9 p.m. Pacific, that'll be 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I will cover more content on codependency, and I'll, I'll cover more of the content I'm going to cover is going to be once you get to the, the stage of recovery, what recovery looks like in codependency, how the relationships change, who and what you attract, the businesses you build or the relationships you build in recovery of codependency is very liberating. And I understand it's sometimes challenging to see that if you haven't experienced it, but the other side of it is there's a whole different level of energy you, you start to attract. So I will be on Facebook Live this evening at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that will be part three of the recovery process. Thank you very much for being on today's Facebook Live. I know this is really a fast Facebook Live. So this is two for Tuesday. We're at the midway point of the month of December. What a, God, what a year. I mean, remember back in March when it all started? It's like this, warp speed. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Jeffrey Combs. If you haven't accessed a free 20-minute coaching call, feel free to reach out and request that, and I will respond to you within 24 hours. Thanks. Bye.